let's get going then. Um, so first off, what did we talk about last time? So um, last time we did uh, some, like kind of finished up the differential dynamic programming slash IOQR story. Um, uh, say details. And then we did, a, um, we talked about how to handle constraints in this DDP context. It doesn't really su supernaturally, does not handle constraints in a supernatural way. It's sort of a bit of a bolt on hack. And um, in my kind of experience, the best way to do this is with an augmented Lagrangian method, which is kind of why I taught you guys that stuff. And I just dropped my iPad pen. Yep. And this is what our labs, um, kind of in internally developed solver called Alshro does and uh, should do some examples of that probably next time. Um, but yeah, feel free to play around with it. Uh, also, it's you can, can install it pretty easily. So that's sort of the DDP thing. Um, today, we're going to sneak in one last topic on the DDP side of things because it sort of overlaps with the stuff we're going to talk about today and sort of works both ways, which is how to solve what are called minimum or free time um, problems. And we'll talk about this in a second, it should become clear what that means. Um, and then we're gonna kind of switch gears away from these sort of DDP IOQR so-called indirect or shooting methods towards a sort of totally different class of algorithms for solving nonlinear trajectory optimization problems. Um, these are called direct methods. And there's sort of many variations um, on this theme. Um, so we're going to sort of lay out that story. Then we're going to take a little uh, sort of tour very quickly through what are called uh, sequential quadratic programming algorithms. These are one of the like kind of standard benchmark ways to solve nonlinear optimization problems in general. Um, and they're the kind of standard approach for solving these sort of collocation or uh, direct optimal control problems. So we'll sort of explain how that works a little bit. And then um, we're gonna kind of hopefully get through this direct collocation story. So there are many, many ways of doing these sort of direct things. And, uh, but kind of similarly, there's lots of different shooting and direct methods, but DDP and IOQR are kind of like the standard ones that are most common. Lots of direct methods. Direct collocation or DIR call, as it's kind of commonly referred to, is sort of the kind of standard, most widely used version of this. Um, there's a classic paper from the 80s, and that's basically what everyone does. So we're going to talk through that. Okay, any questions about this stuff? Last time today, what we're talking about? But, uh, so this was like, we kind of talked about this last time. So DDP is a second order, like Newton type method applied to like in a sort of dynamic programming way. Um, ILQR is the so-called like Gauss-Newton version where you throw out these second order tensor terms from the dynamics. So that's the difference. They're basically the same algorithm. And like 90% of the time in robotics, regardless of what people say, they're really doing ILQR because typically we just throw out those those annoying second order tensor terms. And is there any reason why we go up to second order like higher order than third order? Yeah, because you can't solve the equations higher order than that. So the real reason is that like, we know how to solve linear equations, right? When you do second order optimization -y things, when I take the gradient and set it equal to zero, I end up with a set of linear equations, right? So if I have a quadratic thing, I take a gradient, I get a linear thing, right? And I know how to solve linear equations in a computer, right? That's really it. It's that I have really good machinery for solving linear equations. So if I can write it as a linear set of linear equations, life is good. If you start talking about higher order, you know, approximants, um, then you end up with higher order polynomial equations, which in general, we can't solve, uh, or at least can't solve easily, right? So that's kind of why, does that make sense? And why won't we, we stop at first order? Uh, well, second order is better. You, we do stop at first order a lot. Like, so in pretty much all of machine learning is first order, right? There's no Hessians in there. Um, and that's generally because the problems are too large and we don't want to compute a big Hessian matrix. Um, but yeah, if you can do it, 
if the problem's small enough or has enough structure that you can you can do sparse things in smart ways, second order methods are basically always better if you could afford it. That makes sense? Yeah. Cool. All right, anybody else? Okay, here we go. So the first thing, which is kind of, you know, in the spirit of last time's discussion and just kind of finishing that story up, we're going to talk about sort of free time or minimum time situations, um, which come up quite a bit. So here's what I mean by this. So, so far we've talked about you know situations where you you're we're using like a runga kata method or whatever to simulate the dynamics to roll things out, and we're using a fixed time step in those, right? Um, well, what if like I don't know as a, as an example, what if I want to get you know from here to there, but I don't really care about how long it takes, or you know I don't even really know what a reasonable amount of time is. Say I have really complicated dynamics and you know I want to do things efficiently as possible, like minimize energy. Often when you're doing this, say on a legged system like a humanoid, there's like natural dynamics in there that say, you know, what an efficient walking gait should be, right? Like the natural kind of like double pendulum swing of my leg is the natural thing to do. And if I don't walk at that kind of um, frequency, it's inefficient. I'm using more torque than it would if I just passively let my leg swing, right? So stuff like that happens a lot where there's natural dynamics and you wanna kind of exploit those to be efficient. So if I'm doing that sort of thing, I don't really know. If I'm trying, say I'm trying to find a maximally efficient like minimum energy walking gait, I don't know what the gait frequency should be a priority. It's something that involves like kind of the natural passive frequencies of my, my legs acting like Pendula, right? But I don't know. So I want the solver to figure that out for me, right? I want to I want the solver to actually dial in the amount of time for that gate cycle. So this is the kind of problem we're talking about here. Um, another version of this is in aerospace problems. Often we care about, or anything in general, and maybe, maybe race cars would be another example of this. We care about getting things from the start to the goal in the least time possible. So the objective is actually to minimize the time taken to get from initial state to goal state as opposed to minimizing energy or some quadratic cost, right? So this kind of scenario, both of these kind of look similar in terms of the, the tweaks we need to make the, to the problem set up. So let me write down that minimum time problem since that's the maybe weirder one. So let's say we've got our usual X of T, U of T thing. I'm gonna write this in continuous time. Uh, our cost function in this minimum time setting looks like this. So I have my integration limit zero to T. And I'm actually the integrand here, my objective function is just one. So if I integrate this, right, the integral there evaluates out to, to T, right, the total time. So what I really want to do is add that to my decision variables. So I want to be optimizing over the state trajectory, the U trajectory, and the, the time, the total time. Um, and then everything else kind of looks the same, subject to, you know, X dot equals F of X comma U. I can have, say, um, it would be common in this scenario to have like a well-posed problem to say something like exit the final time equals some goal state. Uh, put that in as a constraint, like get to the goal in minimum time. And then I'm, you know, would probably also have my uh, actuator limits like this. Uh, cool. So this is the classic sort of, um, minimum time problem. Okay, so um, if I were to like, you know, think about this in the same way we've been solving these problems where I like roll everything out with a fixed time step, what I'm really asking for here then would be to like minimize the number of time steps in the problem, right? That's kind of what this says. If I like just change that up to a sum over, you know, which is a weird thing to do. And is, if I think about this, like the way we discretize these problems, what I'm then doing is actually like asking to like minimize the dimension of the vector of decision variables in the optimization problem. All of this is bad. We don't want to actually do that, right? Um, so what uh, we actually do instead is, is something else. So let's write that down. So we don't uh, want to change... the number of not points or you know the size of the problem. So the, the kind of simple trick here to make this work is we keep that fixed. 
And instead, we go and change the time step, the h. So we make uh, h the time step inside our integrator from our RK uh, a, um, effectively what you're going to do is make that H, that time step, a control input. You're going to basically tack it on to your U. In the following way. So I've got XK plus one equals F of XK. And then I'm going to call this U tilde sub K. And this U tilde is going to be the original U the actual physical U plus this time step. And this can be, you know, RK4, whatever you like. And that H, when it shows up in the integrator, you're just going to like grab it out of this vector, right? And I can take a derivative right through the RK method the same way I usually do. So that the derivatives with respect to H will show up in the V matrix now, right? And if you just play this trick, then everything works like we've been doing. Um, there's a few other little kind of gotchas to this, but this is the main idea. Just turn the time step into a control. Um, few other like, things you'll maybe want to think about. Uh, so you might also, for this to make sense, you'll probably want to scale the cost function by H as well so that it's consistent. So really remember that cost function, when we write it in discrete time, we just write it as a sum over time steps. But here, really what it's trying to do is approximate that integral with a sum. So for that to make sense, what you're really doing, right, is turning that DT into a, a like a finite delta T, which is H. So what you really want to do um, is, is scale the cost sum with that H as well, which we have been kind of lazy about so far, but it's, it's sort of strictly speaking, the thing you should be doing. So this would look like, you know, the sort of full cost thing would be say, you know, sum over my time steps, K equals one to N minus one. And I'd have like H sub K times our cost L in here. So that sort of makes everything, you know, coherent and makes sense as I shrink the, the time, right? Yep. It would actually confuse with the problem set over here. So one example that we gave, for example, the project was you don't care how much time it takes to like swing your leg, you just want to follow it motion. Uh, the other one was so like well the example i was kind of talking about there is like say i have a humanoid and i want to optimize like a super efficient like running gate or walking gate right there's actually been like lots of biomechanics studies on this and there's actually like optimal efficient you know sort of gate periods for humans because this is like roughly corresponding to the natural like pendulum mode of your leg and so yeah that's going to happen for a robot too and if you want to be efficient you should probably be walking near that frequency I don't know what that is. Say I want to set this problem up with all the dynamics in there. I don't really know what that it's going to be a priori. So I don't want to set the time for the gate. You know, I don't want to pre-specify that. I want the solver to figure that out, right? But uh, wouldn't you actually like know that set time already? No. How how would I know it? Like the study that you mentioned. Yeah, that's for a human being oh, okay. on a treadmill hooked up to some mask measuring like VO2 or whatever, right? If I build some random robot and I have a dynamics model, I don't really know what that's going to be, right? So I want the, but, but the solver, if I just say, you know, make this as efficient as possible, minimize energy or whatever, that should just fall out, right? But I need to like optimize the right thing for that to work out. And I don't want to pre-specify what the gate timing should be. I want it to sort of be able to dial that in for maximum efficiency, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. Cool. Okay, so what else was I going to say? Um, this cool scale the cost. Um, oh yeah, so then another aside. So when I do this, this seems fine, pretty benign. But even in the linear dynamics case, this ends up being nonlinear and non-convex because even in the linear dynamics case, that H, which is now effectively a control, is going to multiply you know the rest of the state and control stuff. So it's always nonlinear. Makes sense, which is slightly annoying. Um, it turns out there's another way to get uh, this to be convex in the non not in the linear dynamics case, but this approach that I just showed you is always kind of non-convex.
Um, and then the other last thing, there's this, which isn't maybe super obvious here, is um, in order for this to really work well, I also, generally speaking, need to enforce constraints uh, on the H's. Generally, what you want to do is set box constraints on H with like a minimum and maximum step size. And you specifically want to bound H above zero. Because if you just naively do this and let the un the solver do unconstrained things, um, it will tend to do ridiculous things that try to like cheat physics by making like the time steps negative or making some super gigantic and some super tiny and taking advantage of discretization error in your integrator and stuff like this. So if you're gonna do this, you really, really need to enforce uh, bounds on the H's to be sane so that it doesn't do crazy things and try to cheat physics on you. All right. Any questions about this stuff? Free time, minimum time. So yeah, with, yep. Take an LTR. Uh, this will uh, be controlled by your R matrix, right? Yeah, the, if, if you're talking about the cost function. Um, so first off, this is not LQR anymore because the dynamics, even if you have a linear dynamics, if I play this trick, um, this is going to become nonlinear because the H is going to multiply AX and BU, right? Okay. Makes sense? But uh, my question is if uh, the H and the U are coupled, because uh, if you want to reduce time, you have to be more controlled. Right? Maybe. Yeah. So in general, probably, right? But going back to this like example about walking efficiently, you probably there, um, by kind of hitting this sweet spot, you can use less control, right? Which might mean going a little faster or a little slower or whatever, right? So it's not always the case, but generally, like in a lot of scenarios, you're right. Like in a lot of scenarios, if I want to minimize time, it means sort of going full gas, full brakes, this kind of bang, bang behavior, right? So yeah, that's totally true in a lot of cases. In a lot of cases, actually, to make the minimum time thing make sense even, you have to have control bounds because otherwise, if I just say minimize time, the solution is to go drive the controls to infinity, right? And like go as hard as you can. And then the problem becomes ill-posed. So it's only really well-posed in a lot of cases, min time to have bounds on the U as well. Yeah. Sorry, could you clarify what you should do? The time step in your Rungakata method. So like it's, it's the delta T over a time step. Makes sense. Instead of um, adding the, um, the time step to the, to the controls, could you instead have like some of the progress variable added to your state where like given like your maximum control, you know like the maximum like progress, for example, on the trajectory that you're able to make. And so then you're trying to minimize deviation from that? Uh, maybe. I don't know. I mean, I could see something like, like a phase integrated along the trajectory or something like a distance travel kind of thing. So, so maybe that, that would be very problem specific, I think. Like, do you have something in mind? Just like the, like going around the track. Is kind of yeah. So for driving, like race car driving, there are, there are other things you can do along the lines you're, you're talking about where it's like a phase thing. Um, but yeah, that's sort of very, very problem specific. So yeah, in special cases, there are probably special things you can do. This is a kind of a general thing that generally works. Oh, so there you're talking about changing the problem dimension of, of the optimization problem. I can't optimize. So like if I if I write that down the way we did before, the fixed time step, I'm now, you know, and I have some from, you know, K equals one to N. I'm talking about minimizing N, which is not a decision variable, number one. And if you made it a decision variable, it would be an integer variable which I can't really like take gradients with respect to or anything. It's, it's just all bad. Does that make sense? I mean, the optimization, well, like A comes to one, it's a good thing, right? Like, <laughs> one, step one. I can't do that. 
I can't write that down as an optimization problem. Uh, like it's definitely not a smooth nonlinear program. It's something else, right? You could think about doing something like that, but that would end up being like a mixed integer optimization problem, which is bad, bad stuff. You don't want to do that. Okay. Yeah, those are NP hard. Stay away from that. Uh, yeah. So it's literally just, I have my RK step, my RK4, whatever. The H that I take in that RK4 step, I just throw it into the control vector in the discrete time system. Oh, this is uh, how many users can write a calculation? Like, Make it up. Yeah, it's something reasonable for the problem you're interested in. There's no like hard, fast rules about that. It basically comes down to like, what do the dynamics look like? And how many times, like how many knot points do you need to like accurately capture the dynamics? Like for harder problem, you need larger angles. Maybe. It just it really depends on the dynamics. Like, it, and it's not really connected to how hard the control problem is. It's really connected to the natural frequencies of the dynamics. So if you have like our, like some oscillatory stuff going on, it, it'd be like, it's basically like related to the Nyquist sampling rate on the dynamics. All right, everybody good? Cool. Okay, so that's sort of that whole story. So we're gonna switch gears now. Um, and so, you know, palette cleanser. Uh, so now we're gonna talk about this direct trajectory optimization story. So yeah, we talked about lots of indirect shooting type stuff. This is like the other way to go. And there's sort of pros and cons for both. Um, so here we go. So the basic strategy with this stuff, which is quite different from the other stuff we talked about, is you're gonna take that um, continuous time, you know, infinite dimensional optimal control problem. You're gonna discretize it right away. And then you're going to transcribe it, which is basically just take that you know, discretized thing and write it down directly as a nonlinear optimization problem and just go solve it. Um, so here we go. And sort of the big difference here is that like with those DDP things, um, the the answer was like a full algorithm, right? Like you had this like Riccati thing here. Um, it's really about the problem setup, this discretization setup. And then we rely on some kind of large scale off the shelf nonlinear optimization solver. So first thing I want to talk about is like, what is a standard form nonlinear program? Um, so this is in general, not just, you know, for, for control. We have some objective function um, that we're trying to minimize subject to um, equality constraints and inequality constraints. And in general, so this is standard sort of Standard NLP. It's very annoying to me that this is overloaded by the language people <laughs> in computer science. So this would be called your um, objective or cost function or loss. I don't know, whatever you want. For us, this equality stuff is going to be basically the dynamics constraints. And then this is going to be kind of other constraints like torque limits or obstacles or whatever. Okay, um, so you, this is it. Um, there's lots of the kind of the idea here is we get it to look like this. And then there's a lot of off the shelf solvers that can solve problems that look like that. Oh, I should mention also um, that all the functions here are assumed to be like generally like C2 smooth. Okay, so 
lots of um, off the shelf um, large scale NLP solvers for solving that kind of problem. Has anyone done this before? Anyone solved these kind of things before? Ever? Nobody? Yes, maybe. No? Okay. So like options, common ones. Um, say probably the, the kind of most standard one that people use, um, the go-to one is probably IP opt. Uh, which is open source and free, which is maybe why it's the most popular one uh, in like academia and robotics and stuff. Um, another one that's very common in like aerospace industry and stuff is called SNOPT or SNOP, depending on who you ask, uh, which is commercial. So you have to pay for it. Uh, and then another one that's kind of popular is Nitro, also commercial. Um, cool. And then, uh, sort of a, a very common solution strategy for these guys, um, is called sequential quadratic programming, which we'll talk about a little bit. So this is commonly reviewed as SQP. And um, that's how SNOPT works in particular, uh, or SNOPT, depending on who you ask. The JPL people all call it SNOPT, but I've always called it SNOPT. And other robotics people I've talked to always call it SNOPT. So I don't know. I call it SNOPT. Um, OK, so here's what this looks like. I think I. I want to give you at least enough taste for these things so you kind of like know enough to be dangerous and you know vaguely know how to code these things up yourself um, and not just blindly go and download some some package. So the the kind of idea behind this uh, as a method for solving this big nonlinear thing is what we've been doing all along: linearize, Taylor expand, whatever, and then solve that, right? But it's subtly different from like the Newton's method stuff we talked about before. Um, and hopefully that will become clear in a sec. So strategy is use a second order Taylor expansion. Um, of the Lagrangian. And linearize the constraints. So linearize, uh, the C of X and D of X to, um, if I do that, right, I'm going to take that NLP and turn it into an approximate quadratic program, QP, right? So second order Taylor expansion on Lagrangian, that's going to give me like a quadratic cost thing. And then linearizing the constraints, I'm going to have linear equalities and inequalities. So that's a QP, right? So here's what that looks like. So I'm gonna, you know, write this out. Taylor expanded in terms of some deltas. So we'll do it in terms of like delta x. So I'm gonna have min over delta x. And if I Taylor expand f, I'm gonna end up with kind of f of x plus um, a gradient term. So g transpose delta x, and then a Hessian term, one half delta x transpose h delta x, and then I'm gonna so that's my second order tail expansion on the, the cost or Lagrangian or whatever. Then I might end up with a uh, linear Taylor expansion on the equalities and inequalities. Cool. It's like standard stuff, just Taylor expand those things. And remember, I'm taking the min over delta x here. So all the like regular x's are constants as far as this is concerned, right? So it's linear and quadratic, all that good stuff. 
Um, I guess maybe I should mention what those big letters are. So H is going to be um, the Hessian of the Lagrangian. If you're doing full Newton, if it's Gauss Newton, it's the Hessian of the objective, like we've been talking about. Um, gradient is the gradient of the Lagrangian, as usual. Uh, and then C and D are the Jacobians of the constraints. Okay, and then um, the Lagrangian thing, which we kind of know here, we're going to have now two different multipliers for the equalities and inequalities, but this is objective plus uh, multiplier term for the equalities and a multiplier term for the inequalities. Cool. And then uh, we're going to stack all this up. Now you know all the pieces. We're going to solve the QP. And that's going to give us a search direction um, on both the primals and duals. Actually, I should write. Uh... So we'll call that whole thing like delta Z where I've got, you know, a delta X, a delta lambda, and a delta mu. And then we're going to do a line search on this guy like we did before, um, where we use a merit function. So this is all kind of like stuff we've talked about. Um, what's the difference between this and all of the Newton-type stuff we talked about previously? I don't have any... Thoughts on this? Why am I making a big deal about this? This basically sounds the same as all the stuff we've been talking about since the beginning of the class. So yeah, we did this when we did Newton though, right? Just kind of wrote down, got a KKT system, blah, blah, blah. So the difference here is, um, and then maybe it's more clear if I just say it this way, if I had no D here and it was only equalities, then this reduces to just straight up Newton where I solve for X and Lambda, get a KKT system, all the stuff we talked about with constrained optimization. When I add the inequalities, it's no longer Newton's method, right? And we talked about lots of ways of solving inequality constrained problems from interior point to augmented Lagrangian, blah, 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 all this stuff, right? And you saw how to do an augmented Lagrangian method. So the, the gist is equalities are easy. I can just do Newton's method and be happy. Inequalities are annoying and hard, but I do have like lots of ways of, nice ways of handling inequalities, right? Um, uh, so the, the gist here is what I'm going to do is say, um, if I linearize those things, it becomes a QP if I linearize the inequalities. And I have lots of nice, efficient, you know, well-supported QP solvers. So what I've done here is basically taken like the annoying hard part about the inequalities and sort of like pushed it down into some lower level QP solver that I have. So if I have a QP solver, I can sort of generalize Newton's method to this inequality constrained case by approximating everything and then turning the nonlinear thing into a QP and just calling a QP solver. Does that make sense? So the QP solver is going to handle all the annoying inequality stuff through an augmented Lagrangian or an interior point thing or whatever. And I don't have to worry about it. I just have to know how to linearize the inequalities. Does that make sense, everybody? So specifically, if I were to get rid of the inequalities and I only had uh, equality constraints, this would reduce to the standard stuff we did before. Where you, you know, the stuff we talked about before where you'd get, you know, your KKT system and you'd have this stuff Cool. And this is our KKT thing. Um, so the way to think about this whole SQP idea is that it's 
generalizing Newton's method to the inequality constrained sort of situation and sort of shoving the inequalities into some QP solver that we have access to, that we assume we have. So it's it's going to be end up handled by the QP solver. That's the whole idea. Like all that annoying complementarity, you know, stuff and constraints on both the multipliers and these guys, it's all handled by the QP solver. So I don't have to worry about it. I mean, yeah, the QP solver, like I'm for the QP solver, I'm just writing that down, right? The QP solver is doing like augmented Lagrangian. It's doing whatever. It can be an interior point method, it can be ADMM, augmented Lagrangian, active set, and it doesn't matter. I don't have to think about it. Right. That's kind of the beauty of this. New, just, you just, the whole point is I can. Right. This is exactly, it's a new abstraction layer. Like assuming I have some algorithm that can solve QPs, I can take the NLP, turn it into a QP, not have to worry about any of those details and just call a QP solver. Right. So think about it as like, right. A new abstraction where I assume I have access to a QP solver. This is like existing at a higher level than like Newton's method. Right. Um, and yeah, the QP solver would handle the inequality stuff on both the delta x's and the the mu's, right? That's kind of buried inside there. In fact, here I don't even see the mu's necessarily, right? I just let that QP solver deal with that stuff. Does IP opt stand for interior point? It opt? does. Yes, that is not a surprise. Right? SN opt stands for uh, sparse nonlinear optimizer, so that sort of implies you know it's doing some smart sparsity stuff. Okay, so the, the gist is, yeah, we have a QP solver. We don't care how it works or any of the details because we don't have to and use any QP solver to solve the subproblems. Um, but as usual, um, a good implementation that's like really dialed is going to, uh, try to use some kind of warm starting strategy, use some tricks to be more efficient. Cool. Uh, that's sort of that thing. And then the other last thing is that, um, particularly for trajectory optimization problems, like the kind of stuff we're doing, remember the whole like Riccati thing, QP thing, there's all this sparsity structure, right? All that sparsity is coming from the, like the problem setup in terms of like the, you know, time trajectory through time thing, this Markov decision problem setup. So that carries over to the nonlinear case. And all these QPs are going to look like that LQR QP, right? They're super sparse. So if you want to do this well, um, you really need something that's going to take advantage of that sparsity. Let's see. Um, so all of these kind of do a good job of this, uh, or at least snopped and IP opt to kind of both do smart things. Snopped, which is um, sparse nonlinear optimizer, um, does does a good job of this, and was one of the reasons it became very popular, you know, in earlier times on these kind of problems, and became kind of a de facto standard. Um, so one other sort of note on this is that if your inequality constraints are convex, which kind of often happens, right? 
Exactly. Like we saw the cone stuff, for example. Um, I can actually generalize the SQP story um, by kind of just taking all the, taking anything convex and just stuffing it down into the lower level problem. So rather than sequential quadratic programming, I can do sequential second order cone programming, sequential convex programming, whatever. Um, and you can kind of like you know, do whatever you want there in terms of like stuffing convex stuff down into the lower level problem. The important thing is that the lower level problem is one that you have like a nice solver for that's got you know guarantees and is nice. And generally speaking, that's going to be simple convex problems. So this would work like non-convex problem. Sorry. So if I would work the non-convex problem. Yeah. So the, the idea here is I have a non-convex problem. What I'm going to do is approximate it. Here we did QP, right? I approximate, I linearized all the constraints, turned it into a QP, put it into a QP solver. But in general, that lower level thing can be anything convex. So if I had a second order cone, say, constraint in my non-linear problem, non-convex problem, there's not any reason necessarily to linearize that. I can actually just keep it and put it into a second order cone solver where I, I just linearize the dynamics and quadraticize the cost function, but cone constraints I could leave in there in the lower level problem if I have a good SOCP solver. I could do sequential convex programming. This has become hot in the last few years and there's a lot of papers on SCP, sequential convex programming for all kinds of control problems. Okay. Um, and yeah, this is very popular for the last sort of, I don't know, five, 10 years. Uh, okay. Any questions about this? So the technique that we did in the previous class, the IHPR DDP, and we just got very important questions. Yeah. Uh, well, we have to do the direct stuff first, and then maybe it'll become clear. So I'm going to talk through the direct stuff now. So QP is not the direct. QP is just this SQP story is like a solution method for solving. It's the most common solution method for solving these um, direct problems. The direct idea is how you set up the problem, really. And then you call, say, an SQP method to solve it. That make sense? Cool. So let's do the direct collocation story now. And then hopefully by the end of this, it'll become clear what the sort of the differences are. <clears throat> okay, so the first part of this discussion is how we discretize the dynamics. This is like one big difference. Uh, so, so far we've basically used um, explicit Runge-Kutta methods. And so the idea there is I've got something, you know, where I have my continuous dynamics, say, and I turn this into an explicit discrete time thing that looks like xk plus one equals f of xk uk, right? Um, this makes sense if you're going to do a rollout. If I just want to like start at x naught and have my controls and like simulate this thing forward, this is a pretty good way to go. But um, in a direct method, like a collocation method, we're not really doing rollouts. We're going to enforce the dynamics as equality constraints in the optimization problem. So going up here, right, they're going to be buried inside this C, C of X equals zero thing. So I don't really care at that point. I'm not doing a rollout. They're in that equality constraint. And the solver can is just treating that as an equality constraint. So I can kind of do whatever I want in there.
So let's see. Here's what it looks like in the uh, in the collocation case. We've got say a uh, constraint CK between XK, UK, uh, XK plus one and UK plus one in general, right? Equals zero. That's it, right? And that can be nonlinear or whatever. So um, because of that, it it's no different if I use explicit RK4, say, or some kind of implicit integrator. And we talked a little bit about implicit integrators right in, earlier in the class. Um, so we're going to talk through the classic Dirkhal kind of setup here. Um, and the, the general idea is that you're going to um, represent the trajectory explicitly as a spline, a polynomial spline. And then you're going to enforce the dynamics um, on the spline derivatives. Right? So if I have a polynomial, I can diff the polynomial in closed form. I can write down a set of conditions on the spline derivatives. And then I basically just apply f of x, you know, the continuous f of x to that x dot like that I've taken on the spline. That's kind of the gist of the idea. And the classic uh, Dirkhal algorithm, which we're going to do, which is very widely used, um, uses cubic splines. For uh, the state trajectories. and uh, piecewise linear interpolation for the U's. Uh, so that's what we're gonna talk about. As an aside, um, you can kind of keep upping the order on the polynomials and sometimes this is useful. Um, in particular in aerospace applications like interplanetary trajectory design, like JPL stuff, they do this. They actually use like eighth order polynomials for some of that stuff. But um, in robotics, it's not really very common because usually our models aren't that good and our dynamics are not that smooth. So we tend to use lower order stuff. Okay, so let's talk about Dirkhal and how that sort of spline situation works. So um, we've got some X trajectory. I'm gonna cartoon something here. So let's say we've got I don't know, something looks like this. And let's say this is uh, TK or let's do, all right. So let's say, I don't know, this is TK. Um, and then this is TK plus one. And we've got our like not points here. So this is XK. And this is x k plus one. Um, we call these guys not points, as we've kind of already talked about. And these are the things that are actually uh, stacked up in your decision variables in your optimization problem. And then to write this down, we're also going to define uh, something else. Uh, it's going to show up 
in the derivation, um, but it's not going to show up in the um, decision variables, which is like this kind of halfway point, which we'll call TK plus a half or something like this. And this guy, we're going to call a collocation point. What this thing is doing will become clear in a minute. Okay, so that's vocab and you know trajectory on the states, and then on the controls, we're just going to use linear interpolation. So this is you know super simple and stuff we've already seen before. This is like the first order hold thing that we talked about before. So this might be you know something like this, and then you know this kind of thing, whatever. So you might have you know like tk tk plus one, this kind of thing, right? Cool. Okay, so now what we're going to do is write down this cubic spline thing on the state. So it's just a straight up cubic polynomial in T. So X of T is something like, uh, we're going to write these coefficients as Cs. So this sort of thing. So you have four coefficients to uniquely define cubic. Um, the other thing I can do here, which is, you know, kind of going to kind of show up uh, when I start talking about dynamics is I can analytically diff this guy to get x dot of t as well. So we got x of t and we've got x dot of t. And this is just like, you know, freshman calculus. Hopefully I can still do this. Um, cool. I didn't do anything embarrassing, right? Okay, so that's cool. So now what we're going to do is so cool. So I can like, um, I can write this down cubic in terms of coefficients, no problem. What I'm going to end up wanting to do, and one of the big reasons why everyone likes cubic splines is I can uniquely specify a cubic spline knowing the endpoints and the derivatives at the endpoints. So if I have like xk and x dot k and xk plus one, x dot k plus one, that uniquely defines the cubic between those guys. So I want to write it in terms of those endpoint values. So what I'm going to do right now is write down a little linear system to solve for the Cs in terms of the endpoints and vice versa, which we're going to use in a sec. So here's what that looks like. So I've got like um, the Cs and I've got the values at those at those points. So I've got xk, x dot k, xk plus one, x dot k plus one. And I can solve back and forth for these guys. So I'm just going to write this out. So this is super easy to just pick off the coefficients from the polynomials up there. And these guys are 1, h, h squared, h cubed. And this is 0, 1, 2, h, 3, h squared. Everyone saw what I did there, right? I'm just picking off the coefficients off of, yeah, cool. OK, at the two endpoints. OK, so that's cool. It turns out this, you can invert this analytically um, really easy. So you can get um, this guy, uh, same stuff, but now it's flipped around. So xk, x dot k, xk plus 1, x dot k plus 1 equals the c's. And this ends up becoming necessary in, in a minute in the derivation. I'm just showing you that this exists. And then we're going to, I'm just going to like state it later and use the result. But just so you know, this does have an analytic inverse and it's, it's like not too hard to do this by hand. Uh, should also not stress over this slash. If you really care, you can get this from like, I don't know, MATLAB symbolic toolbox or whatever. Uh, okay. Cool, so that's that. Okay. We have polynomials. We can go back and forth between coefficients and values at the endpoints. We're gonna, it turns out the move here is what you really wanna do is think about it. We don't ever actually wanna look at the coefficients of this cubic. We only wanna do it in terms of these xk, x dot k values at the endpoints. So we're going to write everything in terms of those from now on. This is just to show you how to get these things. So now I'm going to go ahead and write down this stuff um, evaluated at the co-location point, at that midpoint. So 
So if I just plug in um, h over two inside here and evaluate everything, I'm gonna get x at this kind of k plus a half. So x of tk plus h over two. Let's plug and chug again. So if I plug into the stuff up there, I get the following stuff. All right, so this comes from the, these matrix things I just wrote down. And now what I'm going to do is go plug the dynamics in for X dot, right? So I have, these are the continuous dynamics also. So it's continuous F of X U. So this guy equals this stuff. Cool. Uh, I should write also. Uh, this is all it's down somewhere else. to be extra careful. Okay, cool. So that's the X's and now we'll write the X dots down the same way. Um, so this thing, right, which is X dot evaluated at TK plus H over two. I'm gonna do the exact same thing. I'm using this stuff in the matrix to evaluate this guy at that midpoint. So plug and chug, it looks like uh, this. Then I'm gonna do the same thing where I plug in the dynamics again, no surprises. Okay. Um, and now the other thing I'm gonna do is evaluate the use at the midpoint. So I've got also, u at sort of k plus a half, again, tk plus h over two. And this guy is just linear interpolation, remember? So this is super easy. We just average uk and uk plus, a half, uh, plus one. Cool. So now what we're going to do is um, we're going to take this stuff, evaluate the midpoint, and we're going to enforce the dynamics i.e. x dot equals f of x u at this co-location point in the middle of the trajectory. Why we're doing it this way will hopefully become clear in a couple of minutes. Um, there's a really good reason to, to evaluate at this midpoint that um, will become clear in like a few minutes, hopefully. Okay, so here's our dynamics constraint, the CI, the sort of ith equality constraint, which is a function of XK, UK, XK plus one, UK plus one. What I'm gonna do is take um, this stuff evaluated at time uh, K plus a half, um, and I'm gonna just set it equal to F. So, so specifically this x dot one, right? x dot at k plus a half has to equal f of x k plus a half. So that, and then, so that's, I plug in this x k plus a half and this u k plus a half, and then I set it equal to the x dot in the middle there. So when I write that all out, it looks like this. Yeah. 
So this whole mess equals zero. And remember, these are all continuous dynamics, right? That should also be noted. <clears throat> okay, cool. Questions about that? It's a lot of like annoying algebra, but the big idea is plug in the spline, figure out the value of the spline at the midpoint and set the dynamics equal to that. Cool. So some notes on this setup. So first off, um, note that only the XKs and UKs are decision variables. These collocation points, the XK plus a half stuff, they are not. You're going to like evaluate them when you evaluate the constraint, but you're going to calculate them from the XK UK stuff. You don't need to actually make them optimization variables. Okay, um, and this integration scheme that we just write down is called uh, Hermit Simpson. Um, this kind of comes from the, this whole idea of like writing down the spline in terms of the values and their derivatives at the endpoints. It's called a Hermit polynomial or Hermit representation of a spline. And then Simpson refers to Simpson's rule, which is like a quadrature rule for evaluating integrals where you approximate the integral using a cubic spline. So that's where it, the names come from. I don't know, fun fact, if anyone cares, random mathematician dudes from like hundreds of years ago, whatever. Um, and then the other kind of nice thing about this, um, so we're using a cubic spline. Unsurprisingly, this achieves third order integration accuracy, like RK3. Um, in fact, this is an example of an implicit runge kutta method. It's a third order implicit runge kutta method. Um, and then the real, like, really interesting, fun, clever bit about this, which is kind of going back to the whole reason we did this to begin with, with a weird evaluate everything at the midpoint, is that this actually ends up requiring fewer dynamics calls than explicit RK3. This is not obvious. I will show you why. And this is like sort of very fun and the kind of main, main kind of cool thing about this. Okay, so here's what explicit RK3 looks like. Um, it's We did RK4 in class, same idea. It's just, you know, third order instead of fourth order. So it has three function calls to the dynamics. So you have something like this. RK4 has four function calls and is fourth order. RK3 has three calls and third order. Um, I'm just writing this one down. We didn't talk about this one before. I'm gonna write it down because to compare it to the, the Hermit Simpson thing, right? So this is what this looks like. It's very similar to RK4. So just sort of cartoony what this looks like. Okay, so you do this three function calls, and then we're going to kind of like compute a weighted average of these three, three guys. Okay, so that's what it looks like. Very similar to RK3. The main reason um, I'm showing you this and the takeaway here is that this requires three dynamics evals per step. 
Okay, now let's look at the Hermit Simpson thing again and look at the same kind of thing. Okay, so here's what that looks like. We've got f of um, xk plus a half, uk plus a half, whatever, uh, plus uh, 3 over 2h, um, xk minus xk plus 1, minus 1 fourth, F of XK comma UK plus F of XK plus one UK plus one. Okay. Cool. How many dynamics calls does this have per time step? How many? Two. Why? Uh, no. So that's a, that's a dynamics call for sure. Yeah. So where? What's twice? So these guys are evaluate time K, time K plus one and time K plus a half. But the secret is that if I'm doing this along a whole trajectory, K plus one from this guy is K for this guy. So they get this, the, the, the ones at the ends get reused at the next time step. And unlike RK3, with RK3, I have to reevaluate that guy because um, this is sort of, um, this last line is not the same as F of X, K, UK at the next time step, right? Here it is, they're the same, right? So these um, F of X, K plus one, UK plus one matches F of X, K, UK for the next interval. So those get recycled. And so if you kind of like fuzzy hand wave away the endpoints, this really only requires on average, right, like plus an endpoint, but on average, it requires only two F calls per time step. So it's like a 50% savings. It's a very non-trivial savings. And um, usually these F evals are like the most expensive part. Uh, these and the Jacobians are the most expensive part of like setting up and solving one of these problems. So this is uh, kind of a big deal. So this guy really only needs two function calls. And yeah, sort of the big takeaway is that's really the expensive part. big deal. Um, the other thing that's a little more subtle, is, but if you know anything about integration methods, we kind of talked a bit about this. Implicit methods are tend to be more stable and sort of you know, nicer with uh, dynamics for nasty dynamics. And so you also tend to be able to take bigger steps with an implicit method like this than with like explicit RK4. So between that sort of nice stability properties, the ability to take bigger time steps and the savings here, this ends up being a big win versus using an explicit Runge kind of method. Cool. Questions? Okay, great. Now we get to do fun stuff. Where's the code? Hopefully it works. Okay, here we go, here we go. Okay, so here's, um, wow, that's a mess. Here's code, yay. Let's like zoom in a little bit. Maybe I can make this bigger. Cool, okay, so we're gonna do dirk call. Um, I'm going to use IPOPT. We're going to do the Acrobat again, like we did last time. So I'm going to just use a library for this. 10 hertz, because you can get away with big steps here, right? So we don't have to sample fast. It's stable. It's pretty accurate. Um, this is just setup stuff. We're going to use like five seconds, you know, time horizon, 10 hertz. So it's like 50 steps-ish. 
Here's the Dirk Hall dynamics. This is the dynamics constraint function that we wrote down. So um, I'm going to evaluate the dynamics at sort of x1 and x2 here. Um, and then I'm going to use the cubic spline thing to evaluate um, x at the midpoint and u at the midpoint. Uh, and then I'm going to plug it into the sort of, I'm going to set the, you know, the dynamics thing equal to this, um, the value of this x dot from the spline at the midpoint equal to this uh, dynamics evaluated here, right? So this is like the, the residual on that constraint. Is everyone cool with that? This is exactly what we just derived, right? And notice in particular, right, I'm, I'm evaluating the midpoint values inside here, but they're not decision variables, right? That's kind of an important thing. Cool. Um, another note here is I, um, we talked about all this efficiency gain by like recycling those. I'm not doing that here. I'm being super dumb. My code is for, you know, pedag pedagogical purposes, not for like, you know, good coding practices or efficiency or whatever. So this is kind of dumb and inefficient, but uh, you kind of get the idea. We're going to use a quadratic cost like we've been doing. Easy stuff. Stage cost, fine, uh, whatever. And then what else What are you doing here? Okay, this is me stacking up all of the constraints. So remember that standard form NLP where I just have one objective, one big C, one big D. So this is me building up the big C. Um, so it, um, there's a solver interface here. We're gonna use IP ops. I'll show you some of that, but it's mostly just boilerplate. So nothing you know, really insightful or anything. This big C, this is the, the C from the stuff I wrote down. And this is just me kind of like reshaping it and plugging it in in the right way and doing some index gymnastics to build that giant constraint vector. Um, again, all the constraints, I'm calling these all in sort of a big loop. This is boilerplate called for uh, code for calling IP opt. It's, there's nothing useful or interesting here. It's purely just a bunch of annoying boilerplate. Um, so most of this should be, if you read it, it seems reasonable. You can put bounds on the variables kind of separately. What else? There's some sparsity stuff. We tell up the sparsity pattern. We're not doing anything smart there. And this, this is all just like the interface code for talking to this thing. There's solver tolerances here. So we're setting like tolerances to 1e minus 6. You can also specify maximum number of iterations where it'll kick out whether it solved the problem or not. Um, I think that's about it. Yeah, nothing else super interesting in there. Just solver boilerplate stuff. Um, so we're going to specify an initial state, which is the downward equilibrium for the Acrobat. And then the goal state is upright like this. Um, I'm going to guess all zeros for everything. Nothing smart. And then we're going to just go ahead and call the solver here. And this will take a little bit. Uh, again, because my implementation is not good and I didn't do anything smart. And I'm also not being smart about the sparsity here. So it's kind of slow. But if you are smart about all those things, you can get a major, you know, significant speed up on this stuff. Yeah, cool. Not too, too bad. Again, because I was being very dumb about this. Um, what else? Yeah, you can see, let's see, how many iterations does this take? 843 iterations. I don't know. Remember that for, for a sec, hold that in your brain. So let's plot the answers. Um, this looks pretty similar to the stuff we did before. Swing up, you know, with uh, DDP. Uh, yeah, velocity is whatever. Controls, qualitatively pretty pretty similar to the kind of like pump up kind of stuff that we got last time. We can animate this. Uh, let's try that. So yeah. Same, same general idea as last time with DDP, right? So you can get the same kind of answers, but here's something that you can't do with DDP. And one of the big, big reasons why this is compelling and interesting. So I got a solution, cool. Let's like pretend that I had some way of getting um, an approximate solution for part of the state. So examples where this would happen is say, I have like, I don't know, we were just talking before to someone about like driving. Say I have like a sample-based planner that doesn't reason about dynamics at all, but can get me like a collision-free path through a whole bunch of obstacles. So it doesn't know anything about dynamics, so it won't be obeying the dynamics. It also can't give me velocities or anything like that, right? It's just gonna give me like waypoints. So it's just like part of the state vector. So I'm gonna kind of like mimic that scenario here by giving the solver in its guess, just X1, just the first angle, not even the second angle and not even like, uh, you know, velocities, none of that, right? So I'm giving only the first element 
and I'm going to add noise to it, small some small noise, right? So let's try that. So I'm kind of like warm starting the solver with. Remember, it's dynamically infeasible. It's got noise, and it's only part of the state. But let's see what happens now when I solve this. Check it out. Crazy fast, and like only took 32 iterations instead of like 800 something just by giving it a noisy guess on only one element of the state vector, right? So I gave it like very little information. It was not dynamically feasible. Like I couldn't roll that out. Um, and it was crazy fast. So here's what I gave it. I gave it just this noisy green line. I didn't give it the blue or the orange or even these velocities. I gave it only the noisy green guy. Didn't give it any control information. It spits out the exact same solution. And, um, and now I can like, you know, do this. But the point is, right, it was it was dramatically faster, like 20x savings in number of iterations, and it gets me to the goal, right? So this is a big, big deal. Um, so this ability to warm start gives a dynamically infeasible partial state guess to give the solver to get it in the ballpark is hugely powerful. And this is like a really, really awesome strategy for um, warm starting things online. If you're doing MPC and you have guesses, it's a really, really important strategy for combining these kind of ideas with other planning ideas, sample-based planners, you know, graph-based planners, whatever, that can give you, again, collision-free paths that don't know anything about dynamics, don't know anything about velocities, whatever, non-smooth. You can just throw it in here as some kind of crappy guess on part of the state trajectory and let it rip, and it'll get you a really, really fast solution. Okay, that's it for today.